Okay, folks, welcome to this first in a whole series of webinars that the Center for American Studies at SDU is launching under the heading American Culture and Politics at the Crossroads, the Presidential Election of 2020. This major effort, which also includes the launching of a podcast series, the first two episodes have aired today, has been made possible thanks to the generous sponsorship of the U.S. Embassy in Copenhagen. My name is Jan Brøndel, and I'm professor and chair of the Center for American Studies here at SDU. This evening, we will be focusing on the theme, the significance of the present moment in the United States. As I'm sure you all have noticed, 2020 has turned out to be an exceptionally tumultuous year. And with the presidential election looming in November, the drama might the drama might well intensify further tonight we have the pleasure of having four u.s based scholars discuss the significance of the present moment each scholar doing so on the basis of her or his approach moreover tonight's four scholars all have a past in denmark each of them having served in the prestigious position of fulbright danish distinguished chair of american studies in the past from Illinois State University in the town of Normal, Illinois, we have Professor of History Andrew Hartman. And in, uh, in, uh, in Illinois right now, by the way, it's 11 o'clock in the, in the morning. From San Diego State University on the Pacific Coast in California, where it is also still morning, it's 9 o'clock there, we have Professor of History Sarah Elkind. From Roosevelt University in Chicago, Illinois, we have Larry Howe, Professor of English, at, uh, uh, and uh, finally, from Indianapolis in Indiana, from the University of uh, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, we have Professor of History Ray Haberski. Welcome, all of you. This, by the way, is a double event in the sense that this is a webinar where uh, several hundred have registered to be part of this event. Plus, this is also an event taking place in an auditorium for American Studies students at SDU. Uh, and we also have a good audience uh, in here. The format will be that each of our four speakers will get 20 minutes each to um, discuss uh, uh, each of your topics, and I'll introduce all of you in just a moment. And following that, there'll also be time for Q&A, and the Q&A will be a little bit unusual in the sense that if you have a question, those who are in the auditorium, please send a text to the phone number here, and then your question will come into consideration. Those of you who are uh, uh, on the webinar via Zoom, and that's most of you, please use the Q&A uh, option on Zoom, and then uh, your the questions will get through. And of course, we'll have to select a very few questions because there won't be that much time. OK, so that's the, that's the, the, the setup. Uh, and our first speaker tonight uh, is Andrew Hartman, who is professor of history at Illinois State University, where he teaches courses in US intellectual, cultural, and political history, as well as courses in the philosophy of history, historiography, and pedagogy. Uh, professor Hartman received his PhD in history from George Washington University in 2006. Uh, his first book, Education and the Cold War, The Battle for the American School, was published in 2008. And uh, uh, his second book, a War for the Soul of America, which is also the name of tonight's talk, uh, is about the culture wars uh, in the United States. And it was published in 2015 by University uh, uh, of Chicago Press. Right now, uh, and by the way, that book has been reviewed widely and been acclaimed widely, right from the Wall Street Journal and the New Republic to the American Historical Review and Reviews in American History. Right now, Hartman is working uh, on a third book, Karl Marx in America, which is to be published uh, uh, very soon. Professor Hartman was a Fulbright uh, professor here in Ulms uh, in 2013 to 14. Thanks, Har uh, Professor Hartman, and welcome. You are going to be talking about a war for the soul of America. Thanks, Jorn, for the invitation to give this lecture, and thanks everyone for attending, both in person and via Zoom. Um, my year in Udense in 2013 and 14 was one of the highlights of my scholarly life. Uh, very fond memory, so I'm glad to sort of be back with you all tonight. Make America Great Again, Donald Trump's now famous campaign slogan, evokes the fervent belief among many Americans that the nation is no longer theirs. 
As the slogan deftly implies, once upon a time, things in America made sense. Right and wrong were distinguishable. Hard work was rewarded. People respected authority. Love of country was widely shared, as was faith in God. But this familiar America, what I would call normative America, now seems upside down in the eyes of millions of American citizens. Of course, it's no coincidence that the rhetorical power of Make America Great Again peaked at the end of Barack Hussein Obama's eight years in the White House. Nothing quite signaled decline for the Trump faithful like a black president with a Muslim name. Beyond its present day appeal though, Make America Great Again speaks to a narrative of decline that has defined conservative attitudes since the 1960s. At bottom, it is a call to restore and revive the orderly, disciplined, authority respecting America that seemingly held fast before the 1960s. Related, this was the America before the 60s social movements endowed people of color, women, gays and lesbians, immigrants from strange lands, and other seeming outsiders and fringe characters with the privilege to call themselves American. In this way, Trump's slogan marks but the latest volley in the culture wars that have polarized the United States for decades. Trump and his supporters are breathing new life into the venerable right-wing tradition of complaining that the nation went to hell during the 1960s. Those on the left, by contrast, have tended to view American life through the eyes of those whose very existence challenges this normative America. So these have long been the dividing lines in the culture wars. In other words, what I am suggesting tonight is that one of the better lenses to view our current Trumpian moment is through the lens of a history of the culture wars since the 1960s. Uh, so as Jorn mentioned, it just so happens that I wrote a book on that topic. So let me begin tonight's lecture by describing my book's argument. Um, then I'll talk more about how this history gave rise to Trump and in the end, I'll suggest that the current divide in American life is somewhat different, more threatening, more existential than in the earlier periods of the culture wars. The history of America for better, sometimes for worse, is largely a history of debates about the idea of America, what it means to be an American. When the conservative politician Patrick Buchanan declared a war for the soul of America during his rowdy speech before the 1992 Republican National Convention in Houston, Texas, he offered one answer to this perennial question about American identity. He did so by restating a theme that had defined his underdog campaign against President George H.W. Bush in that year's primaries. This theme was the culture wars. It was a struggle in his words, as critical to the kind of nation we will one day be as was the Cold War itself. With such urgent rhetoric, Buchanan wanted to raise the stakes of that year's election, more than a choice between Bush and the Democratic challenger, Bill Clinton. Buchanan stated that the nation was confronted by a decision about who we are, about what we believe, about whether the Judeo-Christian values and beliefs upon this, which this nation was built would survive. In other words, Buchanan, people like him, knew what America was and Clinton was not it. So Buchanan's speech punctuated a series of angry debates that dominated headlines during the 18, 1980s and 1990s. And these are the debates that came to be called the culture wars. No single, one, no single issue defined the culture wars. Rather, they are merely ways to work out larger arguments about American identity and even about human nature. These types of arguments are always present in American life. Um, a nation founded on capacious and contradictory ideas like liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Well, such a nation is bound to have such debates. This is especially true during times of rapid change. So take, for example, 
the 1960s. The 60s gave birth to a new America, one that was more open to new peoples, new ideas, new norms, and new, if conflicting, articulations of America itself. This fact, more than anything else, helps explain why the nation grew more divided during and after the 60s, more divided than at really any period in American history since the Civil War. So that is the crux of my book's larger argument that the 60s transformed American culture and that the culture wars are the legacy of those transformations, those changes. Trump and his Make America Great slogan are legacies of those changes. Most crucially, the radical political mobilizations of the 60s. So here I'm talking about the civil rights movement, uh, the black power movement, the Chicano power movement, the American Indian movement, feminism, gay liberation, the anti-war movement. These movements destabilized the America that millions thought they knew. So it was after the 60s and during the culture wars whether one thought the nation was in moral decline was often directly related to whether one was a liberal or a conservative. So the 60s in this way were something of a political Rorschach test. Tell me what you think of the period and I shall tell you your politics. Those who argue that the 60s had ushered in chaos and that such confusion threatened the very fabric of the nation, they tended to be conservative. For instance, the conservative judge Robert Bork, whose nomination to the Supreme Court by President Ronald Reagan was derailed in 1987 by liberals in the Senate who were fearful of his views on abortion and civil rights. Bork later wrote in 1995, quote, the rough beast of decadence, a long time in gestation, having reached its maturity in the last three decades, now, send, now sends us slouching towards our new home, not Bethlehem, but Gomorrah. Bork's conservative narrative of decline advanced a theory of historical change that no matter how biblical, no matter how hyperbolic in tone, was more or less accurate in the sense that things did indeed change. In the eyes of conservatives, things fell apart. None of this is um, in an argument that a time before the 1960s was better, far from it, but in the eyes of many, that was the case. In the post-war years, so here I'm talking about the nearly two decades between the end of World War II and uh, maybe the assassination of John F. Kennedy, a cluster of powerful conservative norms set the parameters of American culture. These cultural standards, this is what I um, refer to when I talk about normative America. It's an analytical category I use to refer to a group of assumptions and aspirations that were shared by millions of Americans during the post-war years, during the 1950s especially. So normative Americans prized hard work, personal responsibility, individual merit, delayed gratification, social mobility, and other values that middle-class white Americans recognized as their own. 50s Americans aspired to live according to stringent sexual expectations. Sex, whether for procreation or recreation, um, was reserved for heterosexual marriage. Americans uh, sought to behave or were expected to behave in ways that were consistent with strict gender roles. Within the confines of marriage, men worked outside the home, women cared for children in it. Television often conformed to these expectations with a whole litany of shows, uh, most famously Father Knows Best and Leave it to Beaver. So these 50s Americans believed their nation was the best in human history. Those aspects of American history that shined an unfavorable light on the nation, such as slavery or genocide, um, these were ignored or explained away as aberrations. Uh, these Americans assumed that the nation's Christian heritage demonstrated its unique character. The United States of America really was a city on a hill. This was a phrase Ronald Reagan used that he borrowed from John F. Kennedy, who borrowed it from 
a long list of people going back to the Puritan John Winthrop, who borrowed it from Jesus. And Jesus was not referring to the United States of America when he coined the term. The Norman of America of the post-war years of the 1950s was more pervasive, more coercive than before or since. It was during this time that an unprecedented number of Americans got in line, or at least aspired to get in line, particularly white, heterosexual, Christian Americans. Even those Americans who were barred from this idea of American identity by virtue of their race, their sexuality, their religion, even they often fe felt compelled to demonstrate compliance. In part, such an extraordinary degree of conformity had to do with Cold War imperatives. A global struggle against an alien system required cultural and ideological stability. But even more, the cohesiveness of this American culture was a byproduct of the internal threats to it, threats that were made manifest finally during the 1960s. It was as if the dark clouds of dissent were visible on the not too distant horizon. It was as if people knew the 60s were coming. So this new America that was given life by the 60s was a more pluralistic, a more cosmopolitan, a more secular, and a more feminist America. This was built on the ruins of normative America. So it's this basic historical fact that explains the culture wars. It also explains the Jeremiads about a once great nation that have flooded our political discourse ever since. Newt Gingrich, who was Republican Speaker of the House from 1994 until 1998, he became famous for engineering a Republican House majority in 1994. He wrote an entire book a little bit later on, appropriately titled To Renew America, on this idea of post-60s decline. He wrote, quote, and listen, this is great, from a vantage point, from the arrival of English speaking colonists in 1607 until 1965. So note the grand sweep of time. From the Jamestown colony of the Pilgrims through de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, up to Norman Rockwell's paintings of the 1940s and 50s, there was one continuous civilization built around commonly accepted legal and cultural principles. Whew. Simply put, for conservatives like Gingrich, the America they loved was in distress. Returning to the values that animated the nation in the 50s was the only way to save it. So this is the best way to think about Trump's campaign slogan, Make America Great Again. I guess he wants to keep America great, but really we're talking about a nostalgic vision of um, in a way that Trump is expressing a desire to take America back to a time before the 60s social movements shook up this normative America. This is back before black power leader Stokely Carmichael criticized what he called the white power structure that had bottled up black freedom for centuries. Back before the radical feminist Robin Morgan sought to smash patriarchy in the name of a future genderless society back before gay liberation activist Martha Shelley informed Americans that she and those like her will never go straight until you go gay. The 60s movements that these three activists helped lead were liberating for a great number of Americans. And they shook up normative America. So Trump's rise to the White House thus seems to indicate that the culture wars endure and have perhaps gotten worse. We can see this in particular in the racial divide in the United States. Conservative white Americans have rallied to Trump in part because from their eyes, he speaks the truth about race relations. As such, just as Obama represented a sense of political belonging for many black Americans, Trump epitomizes the social grouping that has been called, um, to use Hillary Clinton's unfortunate basket of deplorables labor, this is an older, rural, uncredentialed, and yes, white America. So in thinking about these racial divides, on the one side is Trump. This is the man who advanced the astonishingly popular birther crusade that questioned the first black president's citizenship and by extension, his legitimacy as president. This is the man who issued a select ban on Muslims from entering the country. 
This is the man who repeats anti-Semitic dog whistles, such as blaming everything bad in the world on George Soros. This is the man who called undocumented Mexican immigrants rapists and murderers and promised to build a wall on the Mexican border. I could go on. This is the man whom David Duke and other white nationalists embrace as one of their own. So that's one side of the current cultural divide on race right now. On the other side is the massive and growing Black Lives Matter movement. So whereas Trump calls the mostly black NFL players who kneel during the national anthem, he calls them sons of bitches, celebrated black athletes like LeBron James and really the entire NBA speak openly about Trump's bigotry. So the culture wars on race are still with us and more open really than at any time in a long time. Um, during the 1980 presidential campaign, Ronald Reagan gave a speech in Mississippi where, in a county where three civil rights activists were murdered during Freedom Summer 1964. When Reagan announced in that particular location his belief in states' rights, he tacitly signaled sympathy with white Southerners who longed for a return to Jim Crow. But when Trump called the Tiki Torch anti-Semitic white supremacists who marched in Charlottesville a few years ago when he called them very fine people. There was nothing tacit about his endorsement. Uh, there's nothing tacit in his dismissal of Black Lives Matter. This protest movement that has arisen in response to police killings and a movement that has shaken America to its core in the last few months. A lot has shaken America to its core in the last few months, not to mention the last few years heck, the last few decades. To name but a few, over 200,000 Americans have died COVID-related deaths. Meanwhile, thanks to a haphazard and half-hearted government response to the pandemic and to the shutdowns, there remain upwards of 50 million Americans who are unemployed. Homelessness, hunger, mental illness, domestic violence, the list of unspeakables goes on and they're all spiking at unprecedented rates. Our reality television show host president has proved utterly incapable or frankly uninterested in dealing with these problems. In fact, it seems like the only thing he's interested in doing other than playing golf and evading his taxes is fanning the flames of the culture wars to rile up his base. And this is a base that is increasingly hostile to the idea of millions of, that millions of Americans are also human beings deserving of rights and recognition. So, to conclude, even if Trump steps down, should Biden win, I fear too many Americans will think our national nightmare is over. But our nation's problems, which have been laid bare for everyone to see in 2020, did not originate with the Trump presidency and will not go away if he departs the White House. To cite a few examples, tens of millions of Americans are without health care, and Biden is opposed to legislative efforts to implement universal, universal health care. Billionaires essentially control our entire economy. Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, has doubled his wealth since March, and yet the Biden campaign mostly ignores the problems of wealth inequality. So these problems did not originate with the Trump presidency. They go as far back as the 1970s when the stable regulated version of capitalism known as the New Deal order began its death spiral. That system, which is an American version of social democracy, uh, it wasn't as robust as the Danish version, but it was a version nonetheless, was supplanted piece by piece by a highly volatile variety of capitalism that came to be called neoliberalism. Neoliberalism's signature principle is that capitalist markets better serve people than government, and thus government, if it serves anything, should serve capitalist markets. Neoliberalism has relegated the public goods ethos that reluctantly shaped American governance from the 30s through the 70s to the ash heap of history, all of which has been borne out in 2020, all of which would have been a problem in 2020 even had Hillary Clinton won, won the presidency, all of which will continue to be a problem in 2021 even if Biden is our president. So to conclude, the culture wars have marked American history since the 1960s. The culture wars continue to suck up oxygen in these Trump years. Uh, 
But the struggle for the soul of America right now feels much more desperate, much more existential than it did 10, 20, even 30 years ago. The struggle feels much more like a class war. So we've gone from culture war to class war. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Hartman. And uh, I hope you'll stick around for the question and answer that will come uh, towards the end of this uh, session. Now we are going from Illinois to California. We're going to San Diego, where Sarah Elkine is professor of history and teaches environmental, political, urban, and pu public history and runs uh, uh, San Diego State University's public history intern program. Uh, professor Elkind is also v vice president and president elect uh, of the American Society for Environmental uh, History. She published How Local Politics Shaped Federal Policy, Business, Power, and the Environment in 20th Century Los Angeles uh, back in 2011. This study of oil drilling, beaches, air pollution, flooding, and water resources development in Southern California explains how business groups secured their influence in Los Angeles politics and how local priorities drove federal policy in the mid 20th century. She's currently researching the, the evolution of national identity in Europe and the United States in two comparative studies, one considering American and Spanish water resource development and another probing cowboys and Vikings in American and Danish popular history and museums. In 2010 to 11, Professor Elkind was the Fulbright Danish Distinguished Chair in American Studies here at SDU. So without much further ado, welcome Professor Elkind. You're gonna be talking about the business uh, of and in American politics, lessons from Los Angeles. Sorry, the, the business of land uh, in American politics, lessons from Los Angeles. Thank you very much, Jern. Um, obviously, the um, Vikings and Cowboys was inspired by my stay in Denmark and um, an awful lot of time that, that my partner and I spent out at the Ladbu uh, Vikings Museum. Um, where while I was busy teaching American history, she was busy forging nails and tools for the ship reconstruction project, which is, um, I think, super cool. So um, I am talking today about business in American politics, which is really the story of neoliberalism that Andrew just alluded to. Um, I'm using air pollution. I'm going to share a little bit about air pollution and oil drilling in World War II Los Angeles to talk about the long running debate in American politics over how much power government should have. Faith in government as, an, as a social and political and economic force in the United States has faded in the since the 1960s too. The culture wars are part of this decline um, and I think that may be because government rules were so important in extending um, and including more people in the polity, in, in the sort of we of American society. But tonight I want to look at the other side of that, and that is a very concerted campaign by business to present itself as the protector of American democracy. So um, the stories that I'm going to present to you are about oil drilling in Los Angeles, um, where uh, oil wells were erected ne next to houses and in public parks right in the city. Um, and the overall, that story is a story of uh, oil companies and the national government overriding local regulations in the name of the war effort. I'm also going to tell, talk a little bit about air pollution in which the business community in Los, in Los Angeles cooperated with government officials at the local level to reduce air pollution, but did so in a way that really secured their influence over policy. And again, um, all of the problems that were associated with air pollution and um, with oil production were blamed on the war effort as, and the businesses really used that as a way to kind of lever themselves away or lever public anger away from themselves and direct it at the federal government. I'm not claiming that World War II caused neoliberalism in the United States, but this is a very specific uh, explicit campaign that I think is very revealing. Um, so let me start with oil. A surprising amount of oil lies scattered under residential lands in Los Angeles. 
Um, and oil exploitation there has been incredibly destructive from the 1880s to the 1920s. Um, and here's a map showing some of those locations of some of those oil wells. From the 1880s to the 1920s, oil companies bulldozed houses, fires ripped through oil fields, um, and grew to ferocious proportions because the derricks were, at, were so tightly packed and there were open oil tanks, spilled oil all over the place. In 1944, an opponent of drilling in the city described it this way. I saw beautiful sections of the city ruined, and I hope that such will never come again. Human greed and avarice, unless restrained, will destroy our beautiful beaches, our residential areas, without compunction. In the 1920s, Los Angeles city officials actually prohibited drilling near homes and businesses to avoid these kinds of problems. The public consensus uh, had emerged by the 1920s and 1930s that oil, should, oil companies should stay out of residential areas, but that consensus did not survive World War II. Um, Southern California oil fields came to the attention of federal officials and federal officials pushed for more drilling in Los Angeles during World War II because these oil fields were the main source of fuel for the airplanes and ships and tanks and vehicles that were fighting the Pacific War. In, the, in 1940, national officials estimated that the nation would need to double or triple its petroleum production to meet uh, military, industrial, and consumer needs. So oil companies in Southern California responded to this projection by doubling their applications for new wells in Los Angeles, right in the city, uh, over the course of just about a year. Um, in just two months in 1942, the first two months that the United States was in the war, California oil producers opened 100 new wells and increased oil production by 6%. So what did this look like? Let me give you one particular case study going back to that map. Um, in January of 1942, so this is again the first month after the US entered the war, Shell Oil proposed a new well in a neighborhood called Gilmore Island. Because drilling had caused such damage in other residential areas, as you saw in those pictures, and you'll see in a few more, um, Shell produce, or promised to house all drilling and pumping equipment inside an attractive concrete structure to uh, reduce that kind of um, visual and, and um, the visual pollution and, and real pollution caused by these oil wells. Los Angeles city officials faced enormous pressure to approve this project. Shell defended it as necessary for the war. The U.S. Secretary of the Navy and other federal officials urged Los Angeles to approve the new well and all new drilling in Los Angeles, but residents did not want them. They saw the wells as nothing more than a wildcat scheme, meaning a risky profit-seeking venture that served only the oil companies. But because federal officials supported more drilling in Los Angeles, Shell got permission to and drilled at Gilmore Island. And then this well was followed by many other similar proposals. Usually these proposals were for places that oil companies had tried to drill in the past and had been blocked from drilling by those local regulations. The mayor of Los Angeles, Fletcher Bowron, was outraged that oil companies wanted to use the war emergency to circumvent local regulations, these regulations that protected residential Los Angeles. Um, but most other city leaders went along with federal demands for more oil wells. Bowron kept trying to protect residential areas for more time drilling. He vetoed individual wells, he argued with federal officials, he negotiated with oil companies. In May of 1943, he uh, proposed that if the oil companies were opening new wells under the um, auspices of the wartime emergency and asking local residents to sacri sacrifice their property for the war effort, the oil companies themselves should be willing to uh, shut those wells down at the end of the war. Um, the oil companies refused, saying that they needed to keep those wells in operation for many years in order to recover their costs and make a profit. 
because of this reasoning, Los Angeles residents, in spite of the war effort and the war emergency, saw oil companies as really selfish um, and believed that oil drilling was, continued to believe that oil drilling was not in the best interest of the majority of citizens. They also uh, repeatedly uh, accused the oil companies of hiding behind the American flag. Strong opposition to oil wells continued in most of the neighborhoods that had oil in them, but commitment to the war effort tempered that opposition. So some Los Angeles residents remained adamant that sacrificing their homes and communities to defeat the Axis was not worth it. Others accepted oil wells, quote, because federal, the federal government has stated that the oil industry must produce great quantities of war of great quantities of oil for, the, for war purposes. So the story of urban drilling in Los Angeles reveals the way that declarations of national emergency have altered American politics, have undermined legal protections that communities established to limit powerful interests, um, such as those kinds of uh, regulations that in other contexts have protected minorities and civil rights. Oil companies defended their actions as patriotic and necessary, and this ultimately weakened both opposition and industrial regula regulations. Wartime drilling policies also gave American businesses more influence over national policy directly because the federal government needed oil experts to help them run the um, the oil industries and run the oil machine during the war. And that gave the oil companies and oil executives and other business ex executives a kind of entree into government, um, uh, in, into Washington government policy agencies. Um, this a really similar policy realignment occurred as the city of Los Angeles tried to manage air pollution, which also emerged in the 1940s. Um, war, the World War II was experienced in Los Angeles primarily as this, uh, a moment of incredible ramping up of industrial production and uh, a lot of in-migration, a lot of people moved to Los Angeles. And that increased population, industrial production, automobile traffic caused smog which was first emerged in its modern form as a real crisis in the summer of 1943. In 1943, um, in July, an acrid cloud settled over downtown Los Angeles. Street cars collided as lacrimous fumes, meaning eye stinging tears, tear stinging, um, eye stinging tears that brought so many, let me start again, eye stinging fumes that made people's eyes tear up so much that they couldn't see. Complaints rolled in from physicians, from war workers, begging the city council from relief, for relief from untold hardship and suffering. My favorite was a letter to the city council that read, why can't you do something about it? Aren't you important at all? The problem seemed to be one particular uh, plant, one particular fac factory that was producing synthetic rubber for military use. So here's what downtown Los Angeles looked like in the mid 1940s. And here's the plant. Um, city officials tried to shut the plant down at least until the weather changed, but because it was vital for the war effort, it stayed open for months. Um, the story here is really similar to what happened with the oil companies, but not entirely the same. So factory owners used the war production to excuse pollution. So for example, the largest oil company in Los Angeles bl blamed, blamed government pressure to produce airplane fuel for increased pollution from its refineries. Um, and a chemical plant admitted that their new practices increased pollution, but again, blamed wartime needs and the demands of the federal government. Other factories claimed that they were working on such secret and urgent projects for war ministries that they could not allow smog officials to inspect or enter their buildings. Polluters in general argued that the managed economy during the war made it harder for factories to buy the equipment that they might have used to reduce pollution. So there's all these, uh, all these ways in which the industry is blaming the federal government for the problems that they are causing. 
um, and that the war production is causing. The, there's another element here which is very important to this story, and that is that in the 1940s, nobody knew what was causing the smog. LA's major smog problem is photochemical smog caused by a chemical reaction between hydro hydrocarbon emissions, so car exhaust and anything else that's burning petroleum, and sunlight. But this was not proven until the 1950s, and that uncertainty created opportunity for a lot more debate and recriminations about what the, what the source of the problem was. Smog disappeared that winter, but returned in 1944. Um, it was still concentrated downtown, but uh, was experienced in other parts of the city as well. So, so now it was obvious that this was not just the, a problem caused by one factory. City officials blamed the climate, federal officials blamed automobiles, health, the health department blamed industry, locomotives, automobiles, and the incinerators that, that Los Angeles residents used to burn their trash. Newspapers and even the most pro-business of newspapers in the region suggested that strong regulations were needed on industrial pollution or that maybe Los Angeles should stop industrial growth and not have not increase the number of factories or increase production. The Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, which is a group of uh, most of the businesses in Los Angeles, agreed with the health department that air pollution did not originate exclusively from industrial plants. So they took action to reduce smog, but they also worked really hard to protect future economic growth and to use this as an opportunity to enhance their political influence um, in the city generally. Um, no, I have part, about four minutes uh, left. How much? Four minutes? Five minutes. So that's five, five minutes. Okay. Part of what was going on for them is for the Chamber of Commerce is they uh, wanted they were afraid that public anger would turn uh, would turn the public against them. Um, and what the chamber did to protect its influence is to provide elected officials with data. They studied air pollution, they wrote laws, and they defended local officials when, um, when the public turned against them and, got, uh, and protested that they weren't doing enough or doing enough fast enough. What, um, so let me just skip ahead so I don't run over. By the end of the war, and I know I'm not relating this as directly to the present as, as Andrew did, um, uh, but I think you can see the connection here. The end of the war didn't solve air pollution or oil drilling, and both continued. Um, uh, what uh, the oil companies were able to do things like wrap their wells, as you see here, which kind of reduced some of the opposition. But the real significant factor was that um, that pattern of blaming the federal government for the problems that were experienced locally transformed Los Angeles residents' confidence that government was the solution to their problems and made them much more willing to accept that industry and corporations would protect them from the power of government rather than the other way around. And that I think is, lies uh, at the heart of part of the neolib neoliberalism that has emerged since the 1960s is this view of government as the threat and the, uh, the accusations of government being the problem, not the solution, having some viability and having some political legs um, uh, derive, I think, from this very active campaign of portraying the government regulations and government demands as the problems that are um, were, that Los Angeles residents experienced during and after World War II. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Elkind. And this was a talk on the business of and in American politics. Sorry for getting the title wrong the first time. Okay, uh, and of course you'll stay on also. And now we are moving from California and um, 
back to Illinois, this time to Roosevelt University in Chicago, where uh, uh, Professor Emeritus Larry Howe will be, to, uh, who, is, uh, uh, who is Professor of, Emeritus of English and Film Studies uh, and specializes in American, African American and Canadian literature and film history, uh, will be giving a talk. Uh, he is the author of Mark Twain and the novel uh, of refocusing Chaplin, a screen icon through critical lenses, and uh, most recently in 2017, Mark Twain and Money, Language, Capital, and Culture. Presently, he's working on an edition of George Schuyler's satirical writings in The Messenger, 1922 to 26, and Professor Howard's past president of the Mark Twain Circle of America and editor of Studies in American Humor, published by Penn State University Press. And back in 2014 to 15, Larry Howe was the Fulbright Danish Distinguished Chair in American of American Studies here at, S uh, at SDU uh, in Denmark. Welcome, Professor Howe. Thank you, Jorn. Uh, it's very nice to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and it's nice to see uh, some familiar faces here on the screen. Uh, uh, my only regret is that uh, we couldn't hold this thing in person in Unza. Um, like Andrew, uh, my year in Denmark was really the highlight of my career. Um, I'm going to um, leave you of having to look at me by sharing my screen with you. So you can see a slideshow that will give you a little bit of an outline of what I'm talking about today. Um, the title is At Wit's End, American Humor in Crisis. And I'm going to be talking about um, uh, American humor from the perspective of my uh, role as the editor of Studies in American Humor. Um, uh, American humor is uh, really uh, in a quandary at the moment for a number of reasons, and both comedians and, and scholars of American humor are absorbed with this quandary. I'm going to be looking at it uh, within three perspectives. First, COVID-19, then the Black Lives Matter movement, and finally, national politics. So um, when I was a child, my parents had this book on uh, a shelf in the living room of our house. Um, Laughter is the best medicine. It was sort of a Reader's Digest compilation of jokes and funny stories. It was uh, compiled by Bennett Cerf, um, who was um, a, an important figure in American publishing. He was the co-founder of Random House after having worked at Boney and Liveright and issued the Modern Library Editions. Um, and he was a kind of, well, he first began as a kind of public intellectual, but became almost more of a public gadfly. He appeared on as a celebrity guest on television talk shows. But he's, uh, aside from the, the breadth of publishing that Random House did, his name went on a number of humor anthologies. There may be at least a dozen uh, different titles. So he became kind of an arbiter of American humor. What I didn't realize at the time is that this notion that laughter is the best medicine uh, did not originate with him. Uh, in fact, there is a King James Bible quotation that uh, alludes to the same. And Lord Byron himself noticed, no, noted that laughter is, it's cheap, it is a cheap medicine. But this idea of laughter as, a, um, uh, as the best medicine led to a kind of cliche that uh, has taken hold in American culture. In fact, probably, probably more broadly than in the United States, but I'm restricting my focus to that. So um, I think it's worth thinking about how effective laughter is in this particular moment. And we'll start with COVID-19. Worldwide, the number of cases are escalating as, as they are in the United States. Uh, number of deaths escalating. Now we've hit a million worldwide deaths, according to data just released today, and over 209,000 deaths in the United States. This is, uh, the problem is magnified when we realize the disparity of the United States population to the number of cases and fatalities. It's hard to think of this as anything that we can laugh at. But if there is a punchline in this, it is probably the you know, notorious claim that U.S. has the best healthcare system in the world. Let's see what the WHO has to say about that. Hmm. So much for that chant, we're number one. 
Uh, it turns out with respect to healthcare, we're number 37. Uh, not much of a laughing matter. Now, it's not simply healthcare that COVID-19 has uh, impacted, but also the economy as well, as I'm sure you know. Uh, steep decline in GDP in the second quarter, and that 9.5% is not annualized, which is the typical um, uh, way of describing GDP, but I think that number would be far too frightening. Um, right now, it's over 30 million people unemployed. Some have clearly come back, but not nearly enough. New unemployment claims run about 850,000 or more for the last 25 weeks straight, leaving an unemployment rate of 8.5%. And the last two months had gains well below predictions. We won't know what September's employment, uh, the unemployment numbers are until the uh, end of the first week in October. Uh, and sadly, in many states, and this, the unemployment programs in the, in, uh, the uh, United States are run at the state level, many, ma uh, many people who are on unemployment are about to be thrown off because they've uh, reached the limit that their state allows. Uh, and lastly is the really grim prediction that perhaps 7.5 million businesses are likely to close permanently. And the impact of that, I think, is really hard to fathom. So how does humor fit into this picture? Uh, we might want to think about this in light of three dominant theories. The first theory is the superiority theory, and it goes back to Aristotle and Hobbes, and it's the notion that ridiculing someone else is a way of establishing one's superiority. Uh, mainstream jokes told by whites, let's say, in the United States about minorities or about women uh, fit into this superiority theory. Uh, the second uh, dominant theory is incongruity theory, which comes originally from Kant and is expanded by Bergson, the French theorist of comic laughter, and it acknowledges the way in which conflicting frames of reference um, uh, create a kind of disparity that is resolved through the cleverness of humor. Uh, hard to think about the um, situations that we're facing right now, both economically and in terms of healthcare, uh, because of, you know, in a humorous vein, because they create such a stark incongruity to the stability of the country that Americans like to imagine. And then the third major theory is the relief theory. Um, this is sort of um, best thought of as the, the punching up model, a lot of satire that pokes fun at the powerful. Uh, or uh, ethnic humor that looks at the, the uh, folly of dominant culture uh, fit into this idea of relief theory, and it's a way of releasing anxiety through humor. Unfortunately, it's hard to use relief theory in the midst of a pandemic for which there uh, is no real relief on the immediate horizon. So these three dominant theories expose um, sort of the shortfalls of humor in a moment when uh, we really could use it. Um, a couple of other subsidiary theories, benign violation theory and defensive humor, synthesize at least two of the three above. And here too, we, well, we see the limits of these theories. For one, the violations, economic and uh, moral, um, that COVID has introduced are hardly benign. And, um, you know, it's, you know, because there's no, um, there's no safe haven. Um, that you know, a pandemic is likely to strike, uh, the, the disease is likely to strike anyone, perhaps not in an equal way, but nonetheless, um, that and the repercussions of the economy are likely to make everyone uh, feel the pain to some, some degree or another. So in other words, the pandemic has made humor all but obsolete. And we see this in the way in which Late night comedians have struggled. Jokes about COVID restrictions really have, you know, very little comic effect. And uh, the usual delivery of comedy uh, no longer functions in the way in which uh, professional comedians expected it to. Just like uh, most of us uh, being doing our work sequestered at home, late night comedians are doing the same. And it, you know, and it shows what kind of stress it puts upon them. Um, the, the low production values of their performances um, uh, are really leaving them in, in a difficult situation. They're relying on their families rather than on other professionals. 
um, and they are struggling with Zoom just like the rest of us. And they're, uh, as a result, their comic timing is also disrupted by the lack of a live audience. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I've noticed in the survey of late night comedians through you know, YouTube presentations is the degree to which they end up spending most of their time talking about how weird it is to do their jobs under the situations, uh, under the conditions that they're now forced to live with. There was a really interesting interplay between Trevor Noah and Stu Stephen Colbert in which they talked about how they had no idea whether or not they were succeeding because they had no live audience. They would tell a joke, but they had no idea if it was landing at all. Uh, so as a result, comedians are losing traction. Uh, comedians have a kind of cultural role. In fact, it's an it's a, uh, expanding cultural role. Uh, recent surveys have shown that uh, a growing number of people, and particularly younger people, uh, get a lot of their insight about the news through late night comedians. And if uh, comedians are struggling to perform their role, the, their impact as uh, you know, sort of cultural interpreters is likely to uh, diminish as well. Um, and in, in their place, memes are filling the void, but how effectively memes do that is something that's open to debate. Now, I wanna shift gears here now and talk about um, uh, the conditions of Black Lives Matter. And we'll start with Black Laughs because Black Laughter has been often extolled as a, a really important uh, part of African-American culture uh, and that with an emphasis on resilience, not unlike other minorities. Native American humor all, also functions on resilience. Um, but historically, white society has often discouraged or even prohibited black laughter. Ralph Ellison, in an essay called uh, An Extravagance of Laughter, uh, refers to um, a myth. Some people think it actually happened, but I don't think there's actually evidence that laughing barrels were real. But there is a myth of southern towns setting up uh, laughing barrels in the town square, and these were for the purposes of containing black laughter. The idea being that a African-American person who feels the urge to laugh at something he or she sees in the public square must stick their head in the barrel and thus therefore contain that laughter from breaking out and causing a disruption uh, to uh, uh, you know, public order. And um, also laughter was in some places unlawful. The Washington Bee in 1898 reports it is against the law for a black person to laugh at a policeman in the street. So black laughter, you know, while it may offer a certain amount of uh, consolation and resilience for the community, stands in a, in a very you know, awkward, if not dangerous position within the culture. And then of course, we have the events on May 25th of this year in Minneapolis. I'm referring obviously to the murder of George Floyd. Um, what America and what the world witnessed in those videos um, precluded anyone from really laughing. I'm gonna to return to this in a moment, but I wanna talk first about um, uh, two traditions that are kind of in opposition to each other. One is uh, violence against, against blacks versus black laughter. Now, people are very familiar with the traditions of violence against Blacks for the most part, starting with the, um, the uh, brutality of slavery and then the terrorism of the, the Jim Crow era, which included lynching, destruction of Black businesses, um, in, including the, the murder of 15-year-old Emmett Till uh, in Mississippi, um, uh, and you know, as well as a number of other more subtle uh, impositions and um, uh, discriminations against African Americans, but leading right up to the contemporary moment where we are um, seeing uh, iPhone video uh, images of, of, of uh, assaults on African Americans. Uh, and opposed to this, of course, is the idea of black laughter, which starts uh, in its earliest forms with folk tales of cleverness, trickster tales like those involving Br'er Rabbit or Br'er Fox uh, or other variations on that. 
And then a, a little later develops the notion of minstrel humor that parodied white power. This is before white performers appropriated uh, minstrelsy using blackface to um, you know, uh, ridicule blacks. But prior to that, African-American minstrel humor um, ridiculed white power. And this is an outgrowth from um, the era of slavery. Uh, and then after that, we have Chitlin circuit comedians. And these are black comedians performing for black uh, audiences in small you know, clubs, you know, speakeasies, juke joints. All of these are forms of uh, humor that rely on the re relief theory. The idea that there's a way for, for a person within a group that has uh, less proportionate power to push back against the dominant culture. Now in the 1960s, black comedians enter the mainstream. Black comedians are now you know, performing for either mixed audiences or even just white audiences. And they tend to form two different groups, uh, non-threatening versus risk takers. And the non-threatening category, we have uh, a figure like Bill Cosby uh, before he became you know, the sexual predator monster that you know, he's been exposed as now. Um, and on the risk taker category, we have a figure like Dick Gregory. Uh, Dick Gregory um, pulled no punches. He was you know, very active in the civil rights movement and did not tell jokes intended to make white, pe white people feel better. Um, he was active on the picket line and he, he was also arrested, not like Bill Cosby though, more like John Lewis uh, performing what Lewis referred to as making good trouble. Now, from the uh, tradition that uh, risk takers um, took on, we have development of television and movies, things like the contemporary program Blackish or before that um, In Living Color that uh, Ivory Keen Wayans developed. But uh, the example that I want to focus on just for a second here is the film Bamboozled by Spike Lee from 2000. And this is a, a really remarkable film because it takes on the American entertainment industry in a very aggressive way, acknowledging the ways in which it has um, sort of minimized or degraded black dignity, and it exposes the racist underpinnings of the American. Four minutes. Okay, thank you. Now we can draw a line from bamboozled to the murder of George Floyd and the way in which um, uh, uh, African Americans have responded aggressively in response to this, and not just African Americans. Uh, the response to the murder of George Floyd updates that critique of bamboozle and calls for America to react with a kind of urgency. We have in this case kind of iPhone video that functions as a kind of snuff film. The first uh, you know, video footage of police violence against uh, a black figure was. Um, the uh, beating of Rodney King by Coons and Powell, and that galvanized Americans' attention. But now iPhone video, you know, and its ability to be disseminated widely and almost immediately um, has a really incredible social power to, uh, to mobilize people in protest. We get grief, we get outrage, but we get really no jokes. I'm going to show you a few images of cartoons here that uh, are responses that are not funny, but using the typical you know, format of comics to call attention to historical continuities between the lynching of the late 19th century, early 20th century, and the knee on the neck that uh, the Minneapolis police imposed. And then of course, the incongruity of uh, um, protesters over um, Colin Kaepernick's kneeling and the you know, uh, kneeling that um, was you know, the act of violence on uh, George Floyd that ultimately took his life. And then another one that brings together COVID and Black Lives Matter. The last thing I want to talk about with respect to um, uh, the African-American response is the Dave Chappelle 846 Netflix special. This moves from the laughter of resilience to really the expression of outrage and resistance. If you've not seen it, I strongly recommend you do. 
uh, Chappelle is really at odds to find himself you know, adjusting to uh, having to talk about um, and make jokes in a moment when there's really nothing to laugh at. Now, I'll very quickly close here with political humor. Um, this is a famous quotation uh, from Mark Twain's Mysterious Stranger that is often cited, um, and but it's it's rather problematic because we you know, we really have to ask to what degree does satire of people in power affect public public opinion or affect those in power? And one example that calls attention to this is the White House Correspondents Dinner from 2011, in which both Barack Obama and Seth Meyers actively mocked Donald Trump, who was in the audience. And it has, um, it has been alleged that it was this experience that motivated Donald Trump to finally decide to run for president in 2016. We have, uh, you know, a series, it's not just comedians who are struggling with, you know, with uh, the difficulty in the current moment, but we also have laughter at risk. Denise, Denise Farouz, a member of Code Pink, was prosecuted for laughing. She was in attendance at the um, uh, confirmation hearing of Jeff Sessions. And when uh, Richard Shelby introduced Sessions at the hearing, <clears throat> he lauded uh, uh, the nominee's record of, quote, treating all Americans equally under the law. And at that moment, Denise Farouz laughed and she claimed in her defense she just couldn't hold it. It was a spontaneous reaction. So I'll close here in uh, noting that the U.S. has for a long time faced significant challenges that unsettled American humor. The, more, the last most recent one was 9-11, when comedy went dark for, uh, I think, about a month. Late Night Comedians, Saturday, uh, Saturday Night Live, there was a sense that laughter was just not appropriate at this moment. Assassinations in the 1960s were particularly dark times. Um, but at this moment, there's this sort of strange confluence of the deadly pandemic and the uncertainty that, it, that hangs over us because of it. The, the long history of violence against minorities and the political environment in which truth has come under attack. Comedy is at a kind of crossroads and it's not clear if we can laugh or even vote our way out of the crisis. And you, you might notice that I didn't even mention that California is on fire and that the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets are melting into the oceans. So clearly we have uh, more challenges to laughter that lie ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Professor Howard. We are now uh, going to Indiana, um, to Indianapolis, uh, to Professor Raymond Habersky, uh, who's professor of history and director of American studies at IUPUI, uh, which stands for Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Uh, he also directs the Institute for American Thought and is part of the Center for the Study of Religion and American Culture. For the 2008 to 9 academic year, he held the Fulbright uh, distinguished, Danish Distinguished Chair in American Studies uh, at Copenhagen Business uh, School. Uh, Habersky is trained in 20th century U.S. history with a focus on intellectual history, and uh, his books include, and there are a lot of them, It's Only a Movie, Film and Films and Critics in American Culture 2001, Freedom to Offend, how New York remade movie culture 2007, The Miracle Case, Film Censorship and the Supreme Court 2008, God and War, American Civil Religion since 1945, 2012, Voice of Empathy, A History of Franciscan uh, Media in the United States, 2018, and with uh, Andrew Hartman, who we heard earlier, uh, they've edited American Labyrinth, Intellectual History for Complicated Times, 2018, and also uh, edited with Philip Goff and Rice Williams, uh, Civil Religion Today, which is on its way out. So lots and lots of, of things here. But uh, right now, uh, Ray Habersky uh, is going to be talking about the God that failed a revelation. Thank you. Thanks, Ian, and thank you, Tess, to you and all of our colleagues there. Thank you to the U.S. Embassy for its continued support for the Fulbright organization for events like this. So in 2008, after Obama was elected, I gave this talk about him being the first pop president. It was so easy. People were excited. There was a lot of joy in Denmark. 
I mean, who was that naive guy giving that talk? You know, looking back on it now, I joked with Yearn before this that I would just read the front page of the Washington Post and the New York Times and we could discuss. Uh, so consider, just in the last few days, the President of the United States has made statements that directly undermine the most fundamental pillars of democracy, the veracity of voting in a national election, and the peaceful transfer of power after that election. American cities continue to erupt in protest over police violence against African Americans and the incapacity of the courts to provide some sort of rationale for passing judgment on us all. The West Coast of the United States has experienced wildfires on the scale unprecedented in American history, while the East Coast braces for more catastrophic storms and hurricanes, and both situations are fed by a kind of grotesque combination of human-induced climate change and Republican coordinated dismissal of climate science. And of course, there is the global pandemic of COVID-19 that has laid bare a socioeconomic uh, caste system in the United States in which those who are most in need of support are often the lowest paid and the least prepared to endure an illness that has killed over 200,000 Americans. But hey, the NFL is on TV and American schools are partly open. I find it beyond difficult to analyze this hit list of American tragedies. And while every item I listed above has historical roots and implications, I am wholly inadequate to assess the collective significance of democracy, public health, and justice. I don't subscribe to a world encompassing theory or a totalistic faith, either of which might explain away the present crisis. So instead I'd like to explore why I think many of us feel at a loss uh, to make uh, sense of America's future, let alone the country's past. To do that, I am going to speak unapologetically in terms of we and us, and I am going to ask that we think through metaphors. So the first part of the title of my talk refers to the book, The God That Failed, which appeared in 1950 at the height of the ideological Cold War and then in the midst of an American religious revival. The editors of the book intended their volume to support anti-communist propaganda and to a lesser degree inspire reckoning among some in the Western left with their affection and support for the Soviet Union. Since the publication of that book, American liberals have often used it as shorthand, a metaphor for demanding that Marxists own the horrors of communism. The essayists in The God That Failed made it clear that they rejected a moral equivalency between communism and democracy. There was a system of tyranny under communist rulers such as Stalin and a system of rights under Western democracies. The conflict between these two systems required abandoning the false god of communism, they argued, and throwing support behind countries opposed to Soviet power and influence. The subtitle of my remarks is a reference to the book of Revelation in the New Testament and the apocalyptic visions that dominate its texts. Among those visions are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, who will bring ruin upon the earth so that, as prophesied by the author, a new godly world can emerge. This book, Like the God That Failed, has often been used as a metaphor by generations of Americans who look forward to some great destructive event that will clear the way for a better United States to emerge. Taken as a whole, I want this title to suggest that contemporary America is trapped between two metaphors, one anti-utopian, the other overly zealous. Here's the problem. Both metaphors reduce history to binary forces of good and evil, and as a result, have contributed to undermining an American politics of care. They do this by advancing dual delusions. First, liberal opposition to all things communist effectively transformed the drive from econo for economic justice into an apology uh, for, of market-driven politics. As the failings of capitalism engulfed large sectors of the American populace, liberal equivocation effectively ceded ground to conservative reactionaries who used populist language to appeal to the many workers in America's old school economy who had lost their jobs and thus lost hope in a collective future. Christian zealousness for things as unchristian as war and white nationalism has endorsed an American Manichaeism that nearly pines for great battles, military, political, and as Andrew suggests, cultural, that will make the impossible not just possible, but eternal. Despite consenting to many compromises, moral as well as political, zealous Christians imagine a country in which they will never need to accommodate individuals and groups they deem immoral. 
Not surprisingly, Americans suffer in a culture, as the late philosopher Richard Rorty said, that is, his, that is suffused with selfishness and sadism. Rorty made news during the last presidential election, even though he had been dead since 2007, when passages from his 1998 book, Achieving Our Country, seemed to predict the rise of Donald Trump and the discontent of those who came to support him. Rorty wrote, the non-suburban electorate will decide that the system has failed and start looking around for a strong man to vote for, someone willing to assure them that once he's elected, the smug bureaucrats, tricky lawyers, overpaid bond salesmen, and postmodernist pro uh, professors will no longer be calling the shots. Rorty not merely understood that this strong man would be a disaster for the country, but there would be almost no viable cultural alternative to him. Indeed, that is a lesson of Rorty's book. Americans need to stop being spectators of their cultural train wreck and renew their dedication to be agents of change and more importantly, of concern for each other. There is a terrible irony to this cultural predicament. For most of US history, a combination of liberalism and Christianity has been fundamental to many achievements of the nation, including the end of slavery, the construction of sustainable democracy, and the reckoning while imperfect and unfinished with national tragedies, especially in terms of national international violence. This mixture of politics and religion helped give rise to a particular kind of American civil religion through which generations of Americans have debated and interpreted the moral meaning of their nation's history. While civil religion is a murky term and one that can sound too academic to be useful, it does describe the process by which Americans and their leaders come to terms with the meaning of the nation, that it might just be more than the sum of its political actions because those actions have a way to be evaluated and critiqued. But let's not be mushy about American civil religion. At its, at its best, it is what James Baldwin had in mind at the end of his famous and still quite relevant book from 1963, The Fire Next Time. Baldwin ferociously captured the rage that racism ignited across America, and yet reached the remarkable conclusion that he believed there was still a way to achieve our country and change the history of the world. In his book that used Baldwin's language as the title, Richard Rorty argued that Americans, especially on the left, had a chance to move beyond zero-sum options and score settling to offer a future that did not depend on apocalyptic visions, whether Christian or radical. However, at the heart of what both Baldwin and Rorty asserted was a civil religion that had to reflect the tragedies of American history. They argued that Americans had it within their power to overcome even the most determined aspects of their history, most importantly, the legacy of slavery. In parlance that we hear today, both dismissed the idea of original sin in American history, and as a consequence, neither imagined the need for an external authority to guide the nation, whether Jesus or Marx. If this sounds like giving, like, uh, like giving into historical amnesia, it's not. Rorty explains, stories about what a nation has been and should try to be are not attempts at accurate representation, but rather attempts to forge a moral identity. The argument between left and right about which episodes in our history we Americans should pride ourselves on will never be a contest between a true and a false account of a country's history and identity. It is better described as an argument about which hopes to allow ourselves and which to forego. In contemporary America, we need to decide how to be a nation that embraces a civil religion of love rather than one of fear. For that to happen, liberals need to get beyond their fear of utopian impulses and Christians their fear of a godless public square. At the heart of Baldwin's hope and Rorty's analysis is the recognition that faith matters. American civil religion has long been a combination of sensibilities that are liberal and Christian, balancing a skepticism of the power of religion with the recognition that people see politics through their faith. That is why liberals seized upon the God that failed, because it warned about a faith, about following a faith towards self-delusion and destruction. While Christians have seen the book of Revelation as a way to inspire people to imagine and without faith, there might not be a future. My conclusion, my conclusion, therefore, is pretty simple. 
Americans must remake how their civil religion operates in light of where we are today. Historian William McNeil recommends how to do so without either losing our democracy or jeopardizing our souls. In 1982, at another moment of profound skepticism about the promise of, American, of, the, of the American project, McNeil gave reason to pause before embracing Ronald Reagan's optimistic nationalism. The historian pointed out that Reagan's zealous individualism and anti-government rhetoric directly undermined the faith needed to sustain the nation. While Reagan is often credited with injecting much needed optimism into a culture laid low by post-Vietnam cynicism, McNeil observed that Reagan had re-engineered the operation of civil religion. Rather than offer reason to believe in the nation, the president reduced American ambitions to a, set, to a set of binary options. Individualism, good. Government, bad. Christianity, good. Communism, bad. In other words, Reagan encouraged a culture of selfishness and sadism. And it is this culture Americans live with today. But McDeal believed that Americans could reorient themselves with a faith that forced them to speak in terms of we and us. He explained that in human society, belief matters most. Evidence supporting belief is largely generated by actions undertaken in accordance with the belief. This is a principle long familiar to students of religion. In Christian terms, faith comes first, works follow. Faith in an American civil religion of love or care, rather than fear, can lead to those works, those policies, and American politics that replaces obsessions with markets and souls with a concern for each other. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Habersky. And thank you all of you for having contributed now. Uh, so now uh, we're going to turn from the uh, presentations uh, uh, from each of you to uh, the question and answer session. And again, the way that this works is basically that um, some of you uh, via, via Zoom, via the uh, webinar, have uh, used the Q&A function. You can still continue doing that. And then uh, we have some assistants here who are uh, sort of trying to sort through the questions and then uh, sending some of the questions in my direction. And we already have, uh, an, and then uh, the, the people in the audience here in the auditorium can simply text a question and then uh, we'll take it from there. So uh, we already have a, a number of questions and uh, basically um, I'll start with a, a question which uh, I think uh, is for Andrew Hartman. Uh, and it, it is about to what extent did uh, Obama's being African-American contribute to the severity of the culture wars, do you think, Professor Hartman? Excellent question. Um, so <clears throat> I think it definitely contributed. So <clears throat> race, um, the culture wars, race was always a really large part of the culture wars all of the movements in the 1960s that shifted American culture were sort of like um, swirling together, swirling around, uh, causing anxiety amongst many people, um, none more so I'm sure than race. Um, and so yes, the election of not only a black man, but somebody seemingly strange, seemingly foreign to many Americans uh, caused a great deal of concern and sort of like sparked sparked even more anxiety, sparked uh, conspiracy. Um, and, you know, you see this in the fact that Donald Trump was really the main sort of leading uh, national figure who led the uh, birther movement. Um, and even though eventually he kind of quit talking about it after uh, Obama presented his long form birth certificate, um, it that is like what put him in the political sphere and and made him a sort of viable presidential candidate and if you think about that then of course uh obama as a black president has you you must say it has a lot to do with the culture wars um 
it's not necessarily, I think it gets overstated when people talk about how race and racism is the factor in Trump getting elected. It's one of several factors, uh, but it's certainly uh, Obama's race is certainly a factor in the sort of continuing uh, culture wars as we see them. Yes. Great. Thank you. We also have a question for Professor Elkind. This is a question from Sabina. A smog wildfire pollution. To what degree would you estimate the subject of climate and pollution to have an effect on the upcoming election? Has there been a shift in the minds of Americans on these matters? I don't, I don't know. I, one of the things that I think uh, has had an impact on um, on contemporary American politics around environmental issues is that the regulations have worked and they worked well enough that people have feel like a lot of those pollution related environmental problems are solved and we don't need to worry about them anymore. The other way in which the environmental regulations have af affected politics in the United States is that starting almost immediately after the major environmental regulations were passed, the conservative anti-government, small government, pro-business um, political movements started to portray regulations and particularly environmental regulations as the biggest economic problem in the United States. And that narrative shapes the way in which the fires are viewed, it shapes the way in which um, the climate debate is discussed so that recently Trump argued that environmental regulations are the biggest job killer and that if we move again to deal with climate change and the climate crisis will kill the economy when there are all kinds of other studies that show that if we don't deal with the climate crisis, we're going to have not dealing with the climate crisis has a great has a much larger economic impact than any regulatory structure could. Um, right now, in terms of the fires, they're so big and they're so immediate that I don't really think that it's shaping any debate in American politics right now because people are just kind of stunned by the magnitude of the problem and they haven't even started building that into a discussion of what the policy should be. Okay, thank you. We also have a question for Professor Howe um, from Michelle. And here comes the question. Do you think that more Americans are getting their news through late night shows and hence with some degree of comic relief? And if so, what do you think of this source of news? Uh, oh. Gee, I am unmuted. Shall I try again? I did it. We're good. Thank you, Andrew, for the signal. Um, studies do show that more, a growing number of Americans, and particularly younger Americans, are getting their perspective on the news through uh, comedians. Um, I, you know, I'm a little bit torn about this because you know comedians are doing kind of quick hit um, jokes on the news without you know. You know, asking people to ponder in any great detail beyond being able to laugh it off or to laugh at the, what looks like buffoonery to the you know, people who are making the jokes. Um, but I do think that the news media in many instances have sort of dropped their response or, or, or avoided their responsibility of doing greater analysis as well. So that leaves the opening for Colbert or Trevor Noah or Samantha B to come in and make jokes about it. In fact, when you think about how The Daily Show really you know, took off, most of what Jon Stewart um, poked fun at was the news media, not the news, about the way in which CNN or Fox sort of you know, avoided being responsible. So uh, it is a bit of a problem if we just make jokes and laugh it off. Uh, but that's part of what I'm alluding to in my talk is that I don't think that the idea of laughing it off is working very well, and I think people are aware of that. Um, and um, you know, it's a, it's difficult for those who are in the humor business if humor, you know, doesn't seem to have the same kind of relevance that 
it did in an earlier, more idyllic time. Um, uh, I, I suspect we'll laugh again, um, but I think it's going to be a while. Um, uh, and, you know, a lot, it, it's impossible to predict how this is going to play out. Uh, and I forgot to mention one of the things that Studies in American Humor is doing is um, we've got a special issue slotted for 2022. Uh, um, Black La Laughs Matter is going to be the, the title of that issue. Um, uh, asking you know, contributors to uh, critically analyze the way in which uh, African-American humor is shifting by, because of the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement and a heightened uh, sensitivity among the society at large, not just among the African-American community, about the dangers of, um, of violence and police violence. Okay, thank you. We also have a question for Professor Abersky. It's sort of a straightforward kind of question. Is it still possible to unite around civil religion these days in the United States? Sure, I mean, it, I think it is, and it, we've seen it in other, after other great crises. I mean, I think Lincoln attempted to do that uh, with the Gettysburg Address. I think there was a, a, a genuine, um, attempt after the Vietnam War. Uh, and you see that in a number of ways. I mean, I think Jimmy Carter for for the first at least two or three years of his presidency did that. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's, it's contrived, right? I mean, we make this stuff up, you want to, you know, you want to unite around stuff, you, you have to come up with, uh, with both dealing with the past in in real terms, so that you don't simply annihilate um, the history of, of tragedies in order to make up something that uh, people can rally, on, rally around optimistically. And I think Reagan did that effectively. He annihilated history in order to create something that worked for the short term and was adopted quite effectively by people who wanted to divide up the United States into little pods. So, I mean, civil religion is not, you know, it isn't something you pull off the shelf. You know, it's, not, it's not a pill that you feed people, you know, it does take a little bit of work. And I think that for the most part, especially on the left, um, intellectuals and philosophers have been working on that for a long time. And I think it is time for liberals to sort of get beyond uh, some of their uh, complexes to join in that, in that struggle. Okay, thank you. We also have uh, some questions that sort of are addressed to all of you. Um, there's a question from Lassa. Uh, and here it goes. Recently, Donald Trump refused to commit to a peaceful transition of power after the election. First, has this happened before in American political history? And second, what are the consequences of this happening in reality? Are we looking at the year 2000 with recount and judicial decision, or are we perhaps looking at even more violent clashes in the light of the current political climate in the United States? That was a long question. I'll, I'll start very briefly. Yeah. I mean, he did say that. The fact that he said it doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? We've had an outpouring of Republican, Republicans in general who say it's, it, this is not going to be uh, a situation where we litigate whether or not the, you know, the, the, the person who loses the election concedes. Um, but are, are we expecting some sort of violent response? We've had violent responses since he's been in office to things. So, why would this be any different in one sense? Just the level of violence is, I, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. Okay. Are there others who want to comment on that? Yeah, I'd like to comment if I can. I think today's New York Times front page story says an awful lot of what people have suspected about uh, you know, Trump sowing uh, doubt about the legitimacy of the election, because if he does not stay in the office, he is in great jeopardy of serious prosecution. And um, I, I don't actually, in light of what's coming out, I don't see him being successful. Uh, part of the, the supposition is that his denigrating the idea of mail-in ballots is, creates the opportunity for him on, on you know, the early morning hours of November 4th to claim that he's ahead and therefore he's won and that those other ballots shouldn't count and that he'll litigate that to the end and having 
name the, the most recent Supreme Court judge if he manages to, uh, to have, uh, if, if they manage to confirm uh, Barrett before the, um, before the election, will grant him the opportunity to run roughshod over. I just don't see that happening. I think far too many people are, his, his act is wearing thin. Um, you can see actually in some of the polling, it's going getting worse because he's talking, he's, he's uh, refusing to acknowledge the peaceful transfer of power. So um, I'm confident um, with, with some caution that some sanity in the American populace will take hold. But if I could just actually piggyback on something that Ray said about belief, um, one of the things that disturbs me most about belief is that people believe what they feel, not what they necessarily has been proven or shown to them. And uh, an awful lot of Trump supporters are convinced that he is the agent of God in a way that like boggles the mind. But um, that fervent belief is something that they're, they're you know, actively mobilized around as opposed to you know, looking at facts and you know, critically analyzing you know, what the realities are. So I'd like to jump in here too. I, I waffle in, in thinking about this possible scenario between an optimism that there's just no way that could happen and a pessimism that is driven by the realization that the Trump administration really profoundly confirms that so much of what works in any community and in any political system is a system of social conventions that people just agree to abide by. And those are incredibly fragile things. And I have spent the last four years continually expecting somebody, the, the Republicans in the Senate to, to put the brakes on Trump's complete um, crushing of all of the social conventions that have structured American government for the last, I don't even know how long, and they keep not doing it. And, and um, so I don't think that Trump saying, I'm not leaving office, I was elected anyway, will necessarily prevent, if he loses, will necessarily prevent Biden from actually being president. I don't think you need the White House in order to be president. But um, I think that the whole system is much more fragile than I ever realized. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move on to another question. This is from uh, Professor Anders Bull Rasmussen uh, from the Center for American Studies. A, a, he says, calls this a quick score, sports question, perhaps primarily directed at Professor, primarily directed at Professor Habersky, but I would be interested to hear from all, and it is, a shift to more positive narratives around Black Lives Matter seems to have uh, emerged in the leadership of a major American sports league, not least NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. Uh, is there any evidence on the ground in the Midwest or in a military city like San Diego of a broader acceptance of protests being about inequality and police brutality as opposed to lack of patriotism? I, it, I think so. I mean, listen, I, I don't have sort of scientific <laughs> uh, substantiation for this, but my social media feed of the younger generation clearly demonstrates that there is a drift in the direction of accepting uh, the concerns put on the table by Black Lives Matter and the idea that what Kaepernick did was as patriotic as the response against him, at least as, if not more so. Andrew? <laughs> yeah, this interesting question. Um, for me, an interesting way to get at this is to look at the differences between the NFL and the NBA. Um, so the NBA has a fan base that is largely urban, much more, um, uh, a much higher percentage of the demographics are people of color. And so the vast majority of NBA fans support Black Lives Matter and did so even before this summer. And so their ownership and, you know, their entire, uh, all of the players support it. And so their ownership took very little risk in being very out front in support of Black Lives Matter. 
Um, and that's long been the case of the NBA, much more sort of like forward thinking and progressive on issues like this for that very reason, the different history. The NFL is in a much more precarious situation because uh, its players are, you know, I think uh, over half of their players are black. And obviously, so this is, you know, the money that the NFL makes, and they make a lot, a lot of money, is based upon the labor of a mostly black workforce. And yet I still think you have a, um, a large number of NFL fans who don't support Black Lives Matter. I, I agree with Ray that it's increasing, but not amongst many NFL fans. And so the NFL is in a precarious situation and I, I guarantee you they wish it would all go away as an issue dividing the nation. I would say, take a look at the, it was a good ESPN article about uh, the Clemson quarterback, like the guy who's, who's like the next great thing in the NFL. Uh, it was a really good article about how he, he is the biggest sports figure at the college level, and he has been for the last two years, how he is positioning himself as a sort of uh, moderator or mediator between uh, Black Lives Matter, African-American football uh, teammates, and sort of the huge swath of white people in the South and across the United States who love him. But his name is Trevor Lawrence. And an article on, in ESPN was really, really uh, revelatory, I think, showing what I think what the drift looks like practically what this drift looks like. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question from Tuo Buo Bujo. Uh, as part of the culture wars, conservatives often highlight an issue that the left wing is creating a problem in American public discourse. The slippery slope from leftist PC language to self-censorship to outright academic editorial censorship, deplatforming, firing, etc. Uh, any any comments on 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 these types of of accusations? I mean, I, I could speak to this, um, but I'd welcome others' input as well. Um, it's both, I think, a problem and much overstated as a problem. I think those two things can be said. Um, I do think that we're in a sort of moment in which um, self-censorship is, um, is an issue for many people. Some of this, uh, the deep platforming, the self-censorship is just, is uh, you might, you know, many people, many of my friends and colleagues thinks it's necessary and it's a good development, um, but, it, but it is precarious, especially given the sort of nature of academia. And we all believe, I think to, to some degree that we need an sort of open engagement of ideas to come to, to come to new ideas. So I think it's a, both a problem, but it's grossly overstated as a problem by the right wing, which uses it to their advantage and in, in very hypocritical ways. Um, because like, for example, those, the most censored academics in American academic life happen to be like pro-Palestinian um, rights activists. Um, and yet the conservatives in the US don't have anything to say about that in particular. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one final question. That'll have to be the end of it because we're, we're beginning to run out of time. Uh, and here's a question from Hassan. The level of uncertainty is high and there is a constant battle between narratives. In terms of the fate of America, has Trump created a false reality of what America is and where it should be heading? Also, how can Am Americans stop being spectators? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And one of the ways to do that is to stop feeling afraid of the narrative that they're being fed. It's a, I think it's what Andrew sort of uh, gestured at about the free speech. What people are, are hearing is like um, a, a tiny sliver of the story, you know? Um, there is so much to unite around. I mean, Sarah made an incredibly clear plea for the thing that is going to affect everybody in the United States and around the world. I think I see a younger generation dismissing a lot of the sort of noise and heading in that direction. I, th I think that Americans have stopped being, uh, stopped being spectators this summer with all of the protests around Black Lives Matter. 
And what we haven't quite figured out how to do is to challenge the power of uh, the, the money, the, the billionaires who are uh, exerting so much influence over American govern gubernatorial structures. And that's the quandary, is that there's now a division and there's a, a kind of filter between the American public and the federal decision makers. I'd uh, echo Sarah's point about Americans not being spectators any longer, but I'd go back earlier to the, the women's marches that started in 2017. Um, that was just, you know, a phenomenal outpouring of, um, you know, sincere, engaged uh, political will. And with respect to uh, Americans wondering about how to, you know, offset the billionaires, Citizens United has actually created a groundswell of grassroots fundraising. And a lot of candidates are actually trading on the fact that their support comes from the grassroots rather than from big money donors. And they're getting you know, credibility with the public as a result of uh, engendering that kind of support as opposed to um, you know, the billionaire who drops you know, $100,000 in a pack. Um, so I actually, I actually think that, um, yeah, there's you know, competition over narratives, but I don't think that people are sitting by and just being passive anymore, uh, especially younger people. They're mobilizing with their feet, they're knocking on doors, and those who are a little older and have the expendable income are actually, you know, you know uh, dedicating more of their, uh, their dollars to political action. If I could briefly say that although I agree with my colleagues um, in terms of their optimism about the shifting narratives, um, dissent since the 1960s has been so easily co-opted and commodified in the United States that I guess I'm just not very optimistic, especially given that the American political system is as has been revealed time and again, especially lately, is incredibly undemocratic. Uh, the Senate is an unde undemocratic body. The Supreme Court is an undemocratic body. The Electoral College is an undemocratic body. And so there are these extreme bottlenecks in our system um, that I think we have to change, reform, or destroy. If like the narr So these narratives matter, of course, but I'm pretty pessimistic. Okay, well, on a pessimistic note, uh, um, I, I, I suppose that, that what you can also talk about, I mean, as, as uh, several of the other commentators have been talking about, there is also this non-spectator mo moment going on in America right now where Black Lives Matter, according to the New York Times, may be the largest movement in U.S. history with 15 to 25 million people having participated in it during the past couple of months. Anyway, thank you so much. Professor Andrew Hart, uh, uh, man. Thank you so much, Professor Sarah Elkine. Thank you so much, Professor Larry Hall. Thank you so much, Professor Ray Habersky. This has been a wonderful experience. And you know, even in these COVID-19 times, there are new ways of reaching across. If we can't sort of touch each other these days, we can at least reach across the oceans and reach across the United States these days. And that in itself has been fantastic. Thanks also both to the Fulbright Commission that over the years has made possible our communication with our four uh, visitors today. And thanks uh, also to the US Embassy for having sponsored this whole lecture series that now has been kicked, that has now has kicked off. And thanks Finally, to all of you, to you in the auditorium, to you who've been participating via Zoom, and not least also to our three assistants today, Sabine Ansberg, Kasper Björnö, and Solva Vium, who've been doing so much vital technical work and without whom this would never have materialized. Thank you, everyone. And uh, when we meet again, in, uh, that will be on October 8th, uh, we'll have uh, Princeton historian Julian Zelitzer uh, give a talk about the state of American politics in 2020. How did the party of Lincoln become the party of Trump? Trump. Thank you so much and uh, good night, everyone.